65, I think, cartridge shots, but it's a single shot. And it was a sniper rifle. It had about a 30 inch barrel on it. And the scope went from the front, it was all brass, it was all the way back, it was brass. Yeah. And it didn't, it didn't magnify, but it had crosshairs in it. And they said with that thing, that error, it added your, it doubled your range and accuracy. Well, you got 30 inches of pipe for one thing. You got long pipe ranges for another thing. Yeah. That'd be interesting. They were making, they made reproductions of them for a long time. I asked the guy, he says, well, they don't make them scopes anymore. He said, because people are going crazy now, they want to go modern, you know, scopes. In. He said, but you see them a lot for sale. He said, they run, he said, if you get them with the mounts, and he said, don't buy one if it doesn't have mounts unless you're, you're good with metal aid and stuff because you'll have to make them. Yeah. And he said they could cost more than the scope. He said a good condition brass one, 200, 250 bucks now. They were like $90 when it came out. I remember that. You could buy the rifle with it, but I, I don't know how great it is, but boy, it sure looks right. Oh, yeah. It's like, it gets people, it's like you bring that uh, semi automatic Tommy gun out. Yeah, it may not be worth good. It may not be worth shit, but it gets their attention. And that rifle, you pull that out, and they're like, Ooh. And when they find out it's a cartridge one instead. And then I looked and I found out something I didn't know. And the muzzle loading ones, the single shot ones, the sharps, they had a little insert stuck in the barrel, a brass insert you stuck on the end of the barrel. So if you would clear the scope okay with your oh, with your powder, oh, oh, otherwise oh, yeah. you could damage the scope with your sure, powder no, and no, no, ramming it in. That makes sense. So they have a like about a four inch brass extension you set in the barrel when you reload. They're not you know, firing this thing very fast, but, you know. They said <coughs> the sniper, high speed for a sniper would be two rounds a minute. Yeah. Well, yeah. And normally they fired about one. Yeah. He said they were firing far away. He said the, the Union officers lane, learned quick to take those. They had, used to have Union engine feathers. They had those fancy like uh, garrison, little garrison type caps. Yeah. And they were like blue and red and yeah, yellow. Yeah, that's pretty good. And they had a cross on them and all kinds of brand yeah, yeah, officers. Yeah. <laughs> After 1862 started, you didn't see them anymore. So they just pick them off. If they find the artillery officer, yep, direct them to fire, and they have about three snipers. <coughs> That's what they got them. And then the next officer, they just shoot all the officers. That's what the Russians did in Stalingrad. They shot them off. The officers and the non commissioned officers. Yeah, both, yeah. Yeah, with that old 9130, you wouldn't believe it, would you? But for close-in work, out to what? Four, that's a good four hundred yards, maybe three, four hundred yards. Well, the optimum range would be in the three to four hundred yard range, probably. I suppose an expert could maybe shoot a little further. Good day, good day. Yeah, good day. yeah <laughs> I mean, three, four hundred yards is. But you know, for in-town sniping or realistically, yeah. Uh, well, as I said, that was what taught the Russians a lot about when they built the eight day was the fact that most of their stuff was close when they were dealing with the ground. There's no more thousand yard shots with that, that trade with the just average battle rifle. And they had the Tolkarev, <coughs> the long range Tolkarev rifle, which they made into the SVT sniper rifle. I still kick myself when we were down there buying guns at Little Rock. My buddy bought guns and I bought guns. We'd been stationed and been hanging together, you know? We were at Little Rock together, and uh, we'd go in there and put them on. We'd drive down together in my Volkswagen and buy guns from him. Yeah. Way away. And he lived downtown, so I'd be fine at his place. You know, right in that back. I'm basically a red shirt. Well, they would have had to put in the arsenal. And I didn't fancy putting a blue handle Mauser or guns like that in, in the arsenal. In the armory, you know. In the armory. So we went down there, and he beat me to two. I got the blue handle Mauser, and I got, what else? Oh, I got a Model 90. 94 Marlin in that direction oh, yeah. with an octagon barrel and rifle, which both of them seem to have disappeared. I haven't seen either one since the play. Yeah, well, unfortunately. But he got two nice guns. He still got them because I talked to him a couple years ago. Just before the flood, I talked to him. He got a S1942, whatever, SVT rifle. That <coughs> 7.62 by 54 semi automatic one. Yeah. And he had a GE. GEW 43, 8mm Mauser automatic. We had both of them. And you know, you would believe we paid for them things over the block. $125 a piece. Now it's a $1,000 plus range. Well, when I bought my 7mm Argentina 
57 or 57 Argentina, and it was like 25 bucks out of a barrel. You know, and it was fine. It's a fine one. Don't you wish you still had it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you put 140 grain bullets in there and change the sights, or you just put 140 grain bullets in there. It's a 175. It's still all of them. Yeah, I still got the old seven millimeter Mauser. Yeah, it's seven millimeter. It's a Spanish made. Yeah, yeah. Mine was made in 1960. It's made during World War One. Yeah. For the Spanish government, yeah. not to export. And I just got—I lost the front band with the bayonet lug on it and the back plate. And I didn't—I don't want to go into where I lost that either. I don't need to tell you, do I? No. So I'm going to have to replace them. Well, that was a good. That was a good rifle. That was a very good rifle. I paid still a good rifle. I paid fifteen dollars for my second hand off of that. I didn't want. They got it for twenty bucks. Yeah. Didn't burn on the barrel with them. Yeah. Well, the Enfield rifles used to be like twenty, yeah. twenty-four. Or, no, they were nineteen ninety-five or something like that. And the Garands, not Garands, uh, Springfields were either twenty-four or ninety-five or twenty. Another good rifle. Or twenty-nine ninety-five. Yeah. And I mean, they had them like in Kmart and Magic Mart. And any March. Montgomery Wars. You would, in, you would yeah. go in there to be like a big garbage can full of rifles. But, you know, like you well, you have been Kmart. Pick out one you like. But well, Kmart, yeah, was Kmart was even better. How they did it. They had the car canos and they were like uh, 1295 or whatever. They had the, remember, you know the racks you see with the beach balls in it, the ones about this size? The big ones? Okay, picture one of them divided in three. Hundred Italian car cannons, a hundred Enfields, and a hundred uh, Springfields sitting there with prices. I'm just walking and go through and pick the one you want and go pay for it. Well, there was no background check or anything. You, you, uh, you used to be got able, money. You got the gun. I used to be able to buy it when I was um, just before I turned 18. You could still buy Lugers, German Lugers, for 75 dollars in guns and ammo magazine through the mail. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. You just certified. I'm over 21, blah, blah, blah. There's no reason why. And it said uh, identification required on delivery. You had to show me you were 21. Uh, most of the time, I used to do it. They didn't care. Yeah. Sometimes they didn't care. But, you know, they, and they, well, I think the funniest one, though, is, you know, those talk about that was before that firearms act, 68. I still have that gun today. I'm on somewhere. I'll dig it out and show you. I found it in the garage, but I don't know what I did with it. And it's got uh, Swedish Loppy 20 millimeter anti tank guns on skis. <laughs> they have wheels and skis. Yeah. They're yeah, the yeah, Swedish yeah, ones. Yeah, they yeah. used to fight the Germans and the Russians right. in the mountains. Yeah. The ski troopers pulled them. And a five round magazine. Well, one guy's selling the guns, and it says, in accordance with NAF regulations, uh, these, and this is a company in Florida, does not include a firing pin in a magazine. You can make a magazine with a firing pin. You go back about 10, ten, 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 ten pages, nice. and all magazines in front of you. company in Virginia that sells magazines with a firing pin. Now you got a fully functional 12 to 20 mic mic, 20 BPM. And what they, why they did away with them was some enterprising people bought two of them and mounted them in the back of the uh, like panel vans, oh yeah, and knocked off an armored car in New York City with, with the armor piercing ammo. Yeah, well, Twenty mm -hmm. came up front, one behind, and started shooting. It. And, and it's their semi-auto, you know, five round magazine, just boom, boom, boom. Once they started shooting out of the that thing, they stopped that van, got out, and let them have the money. Well, Twenty mic mic, that's <laughs> armor piercing. Yeah, you can go right through that thing like it's not there. Yeah, yeah well, a standard round would probably, but not an armored car. Yeah, because those were the old tank ones. Yeah, but the armored one was. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they used to sell them, and then they had uh, French World War One, 105 millimeter pack howitzers and stuff like that. You buy all this shit. What you need, there. They were about 250 bucks for them. Yeah. You could buy the 37 millimeter cannons. The anti tank guns they towed behind the jeeps in World War Two. Yeah. They were like 400 dollars. And you could buy Russian tank and German and American tank, you know, mostly Russian and German tank machine guns. That had been deactivated for like 150 bucks. They used in the new barrel, most of them. In the new barrel, they were the ones where they poured lead in them. You could just eat it up and blow the stuff out and then maybe change the spring. Yeah. The old D Y and that and stuff. I remember those days. Oh, do I remember those days. I was just getting on the case. No. I was just getting in the guns. I am. Not now, though. 
then I turned 18, and then that federal firearm that came out. 68. No, I was after they shot everybody. So, so you know, it got tough. But then that's when I bought some of my guns. I bought that the old Spanish old and bought carbine. I bought a couple of pistols. I bought that Mauser rifle. My buddy had a bunch of guns. His father died. He wanted to get rid of them. So he said, I said, what do you want for him? He says, well, take the ones you want, 15 bucks a piece. And at the time, I didn't take it because I thought it was a waste of money. I should have taken the two, uh, the German and the French pin fire revolvers mm -hmm. for $15 a piece because now their collectibles are worth quite what, good. Yeah. Yeah, a fair amount of money. But I didn't take them. I just took the ones I could shoot. The 32, I've got, well, I've got a 32, 1905 model 32 Belgian made one. I need to have, uh, that's got gunk stuff in it. I've never used it. It's been gunked up and I realize now it's not the firing pin spring that's bad. There's so much grease and stuff in it, it won't work. It's got one crack grip. It's a meteor. If I could get a grip, and I think it's the same as the 1905 Brown. It looks identical to the second one. So I need to get a magazine for it, and I need to get a grip, and that'll probably fire. And then I've got a Chase 22 Lone Rifle Automatic that is, was made in Spain for the French company MAB. It's an exact knockoff of the Walter PPK and 22 Lone Rifle. Yeah. Got one of those. I paid 15 bucks for it. And then I got the Mauser rifle and I got the uh, rolling block carving. I didn't have tons of money in them days either because the grades were about 50 an hour. But oh, yeah. I, so I managed to find 60 bucks. But I managed to find 60 bucks to buy the four of them. Yeah. I just saved up my money. I got two and then two more. Yeah. yeah. We, we did the same thing when I went on different. My well, when this. Just until I had 68 was coming out. My dad went out and bought a pump shotgun because all his guns were not, none of his guns were registered or anything. He had a 32 H&R top rake and a bolt action 22. I think that's about all he had. And then uh, he went out and bought a 20 gauge pump with a bunch of ammo. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, which was fine. When I was in Vegas, I, I brought him home a bolt action 243. Uh, it's a beautiful. Well, it's a beautiful gun. This was a nice part of the other gun. It's a beautiful gun, but I don't really feel any money you know, as much. I mean, I said, but what I can really use is a pistol or a revolver or something. So I went and got a Ruger 3 Service 6. It's an expensive nice gun. 357 Magnum gauge ammo wallet and a bunch of ammo. My sister got that now, which is fine. But yeah, for the longest time, that's. Uh, well, after my dad died, my mom used to put the 357 Magnum under a pillow or a 32 and just pop it over. Yeah. You know, so, what I wonder now is how many of the guns that I bought in Arkansas, say in 1971 and 72 and 73, are they registered to me somewhere, do you think, now? Or maybe not that far back? I don't know. I was thinking about that when I was in the 70s in, in Vegas when I bought them handguns and had to go down and talk to the uh, North Vegas PD. So you had to have your permit and all the rest of that. See, I was in Arkansas. Yeah. You didn't have to do any of that, but you do it. I think they, you still had to fill out that form. Yeah, you had to fill out the form. That yellow form, but you didn't have even, to fill out anybody in even Arkansas. Even uh, in Germany, I did not have to fill out the forms to buy, but I had to get the ATF 6A or whatever it was to import. So they know you got that one because it's an well, ATF. Well, this time, it's long since traded off to several times. Yeah, well, how do they? I mean, okay, take for instance, though, like you bought a gun, say, in 19, I'll pick it, 1970. You bought this this handgun, and you sold it in 1980, say. Now all of a sudden, somebody gets shot with it. Well, the original, if it's never registered after you, you think that people are going to keep paper forms from 40 years ago? I mean, well, they put it in the computer, didn't they? Mm, I don't know. I, don't think I well, the way they are now, the way they are now, they will. Yeah, yeah, with guns, but. I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I don't know. Jim might have a better understanding of that. I don't know anybody who would really know the answer to that. Well, the the thing is, um, with a lot. Well, when I bought my first rifle, it was '69. There was no paperwork. None. Yeah. Just give me money to get, get rifle, and that was fine. When I bought my shotgun, I think they had to fill out some sort of form. Everybody knew it was sort of form, and and nobody paid me when I got my shotgun. Or did my yeah. mom just buy it for me and give it to me or something like that? I forget. Yeah. 
think he had that with him. I mean, I was looking, I picked up the seven mil too. Uh -huh. um, the, yeah, there was next to nothing on it. And you think you bought it? Yeah, I talked to gun, a number of gun shirt stores, and they said, well, if they come looking for the records, there's going to be a night, a night fire. All the records are going to go. Well, like stuff from the 70s are probably gone. But like the late 80s, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they're still around. Well, you know, I don't know if they are or not. Uh, but, you know, the only record that was kept at that time was at the gun shop. And, you know, if the guy comes in, I want to see the paperwork from 1970, but good luck. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, how many, if you're somebody like the Loft and you're selling a huge amount of guns, uh, well, even if you're not, you just, you know, well, they just file the paperwork as it comes in for the month or whatever, not out in the back or not. Okay, this yeah. is January, boom. February, boom. Yeah. March, yeah. next year on the box. And, and, where, and then it goes to the black hole of no escape. And it gets lost, it gets lost. Um, I, in the old days, it was all paper and it was, there was no federal registration or tracking or commission. Well, now there's not supposed to be any either. Yeah, with the government lines. So what? Ha yeah. Well, now, okay. But what happens? Like you and me, we got a concealed weapons permit, so they don't call them in. Right. Well, they don't have to. Right. So if they're, they're not called in. in where's the we're, we're still in we're the old paper, paper, paper records. Yeah. We're back in the old paper records. Right. That's what I mean. You see, that's the one advantage of having. I'll tell you what else I like. When I go to the gun show, I know a couple of people there that used to be dealers. And one guy gave up his license. Who shall remain nameless? Mm -hmm. And he's selling off guns. I bought. Three guns off of him. And that's, he knows me. Yeah. No, he's known me for 20 years. But and I used to, he used to be a dealer, but he's not anymore. He's selling his collection and stuff off now. Yeah. And none of them registered. Well, it's, it's, it's Steve was stuck. It is Steve at the owner at the loft, right? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I was talking to him yesterday. He said, more pressure on gun dealers from the feds all, all the time. So I'm sitting there. And like me, I bought that Largo ammunition. I had Paul get it for me to pay him. Well, the the thing so that way, and he don't have to keep track of who he sells ammunition to. Yeah. Well, here's what I'm trying to say though. I have two and a half thousand rounds of Spanish Largo ammunition, which just I have. Yeah. I mean, I didn't go so buy it. Sky. I didn't buy it. She. I didn't buy it in New Jersey where you have to sign for it. I didn't. I didn't use a check to pay for it. There was no, no record yeah. anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that, sure. and that matches the two Largo pistols that I bought at the gun show that I registered. So now I got two unregistered handguns and 2,500 rounds on registered ammunition. So if something happens, I'm covered there. My Ruger, is all, all, all the ammunition is unregistered. But look at Connecticut, right? You have to register your ammunition. That doesn't solve anything. Oh no, that's what the guy said. But but the pro well, the only thing it does then is they know how much you got. Yeah. They keep track of it. Yeah. If they know you got some, if they're fishing, like a fishing, then they're fishing. They'll yeah, come, out, yeah. you know, come out and check you out and find ammunition or a gun you didn't tell them. Yeah, that's a common. So then yeah. you they make a criminal out of an honest person. Yeah, they don't care. By passing, they don't care. Well, they're yeah. not criminals out of people. Well, it's like, the, it's like the American that went up the Canadian border and he had his wife's 380 was in the car. Yeah. And they're going to put him in jail. Why don't they just take the gun, turn him around, or turn him around? Who's that? Some bad guy. Some bad Yeah, they locked him up. Oh. Try to decide what to do with him. It's like, because I know my buddy was in, in Washington State. He's a dumbass anyway. He crossed over the border. And he had a 357 revolver on his hip. And, uh, no, we're not on the hip. Yeah, on the hip. Now, well, Washington, remember Washington State, if you can see it, you can carry it. Right. No permit required. Right. So he's over there and he's got his semi automatic hunting with the rifle with the 10 round magazine or whatever. Well, I mean, you know, but it was blocked off, you know, because you could only use three rounds there, I think. It was three or four. But he had it blocked off, you know, he had the big magazine on it and stuff. I want to say it was a BM 59 he was on, a 30 out 6. Mm -hmm. That Italian parachute for one. And he had a big magazine on it, but it was all blocked off inside. And he had screws on it so that you couldn't add more ammo into that magazine without literally taking it completely apart with a screwdriver and a torch and everything. You know, so no, he was pretty tough. If you're hiding yourself, or you sleep with all that thing. So here he is. He's out there hunting away. Nothing. 
with the scope, the military style right, with the scope by hand, gun strap to a tip. And he sees this guy coming towards him. So, you know, he slings his gun over his shoulder and goes walking over. He figured it was a game warden. Yeah. He said, well, Canadian not at least. But so the man, he looks at me and he says, uh, see that hill? Yes, sir. He says, that's the limit of the U.S. borders on the top of that hill. He said, you are now in the Dominion of Canada. He says, I'm going to turn my back and smoke a cigarette. He said, when I turn around, he said, I suggest you be back over that hill. He sent him back. Well, he knew it was, he was hunting, you know, everything. He had the orange mountain tag on there. It's a little obvious, but yeah, you don't want to get too close to the border. So he, yeah, he just sent him back. Yeah. But that was, you know, 25 well, years yeah, ago. Yeah, but most back then they weren't real worried about a lot of stuff. They just sent back. When I came down the Alcan, you could bring guns down, uh, down, down and up the Alcan, including, including handguns. Uh -huh. As long as you stayed in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, I think. You had to stay in certain provinces. Yeah, and you couldn't go so know. far off the road. Either. Right, right. Yeah, there was some what Yeah. Thing. But when I when I came, when I got, I stopped at U.S. Customs when I so I had a, a muzzle loader, a, what's the odd six, a shotgun, and a handgun, or something like that. And I, I stopped at the U.S. Customs. Uh, next to the Yukon, and the guy said, see ya. Well, I have to know this. Here's a clear show. Let's just have a nice time. I'm going home. Okay. So I, I got to the Canadian side in the Yukon, and the guy says, uh, how are you doing? I said, I'm going home. I'm going down to California. Okay. So you got some guns? I said, yeah. Any handguns? I said, yeah. I said, uh, you understand I have to declare all my weapons, but we don't worry about the long run. What handgun you got? So I handed him the handgun. Oh, nice. You know, so I wrote the stuff down, put it in a special plastic bag and seal it. And you had to leave it sealed. And you put it behind the seat and you walk, you know, leave your truck and that was fine. So when I got down to the Canadian border, the, the book said you're supposed to stop. Redeclare the weapons of the Canadian customs folks. Yeah. Which I did. And the guy went, so, you know, well, I was told I need to present these to you. And have you do a deal. And you're good. And she am I allowed to open the bag and you're good. See so, yeah. <laughs> Okay. He was more annoyed that I stopped. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? So I stopped the Canadian or US customs the same game and went and told him I said I'm coming down from Alaska and I got done. Yeah, that's good. All right. Give me a little uh, I don't know about the gun. So nowadays, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. They want to see back, back, No, no, back then they didn't care about it. I would like to figure out a way. But you can't do that now. They bring back a gun from Canada. Good luck. Well, I figure it has to, to bring a gun back from Canada now, it would have to be a non cartridge pre 1898 black powder gun, probably. In other words, if you brought back a flintlock rifle, an Indian trade rifle, a black powder original, you could probably bring it back. Anything after 1898 that fired, or if it fired a fixed cartridge, Probably couldn't bring back, like the Winchester, like the old old Winchester. Well, you might be able to get it imported from dealer to dealer. Yeah, maybe could, there might be a way to do that. Well, you'd have to have two. You'd have to have six pieces of paper. You have to have a Canadian export dealer, right, and a U.S. import dealer, both bonded in Canada. Which means there's a couple in Canada that do that. There's one in there, somewhere in Montana, Bozeman or Billings or Mike knows where. Mike Mason, Mason. said guy. His father was a guy I got that pickup truck from. Mm -hmm. He was a gun dealer. But anyway, he's yeah, yeah he knows because he's been importing like uh, Canadian World War II sniper rifles and stuff. He finds some poor Canadian that can't afford it or the, the laws beating on his tail, you know. And I, and I wouldn't doubt that somebody in the Canadian Mounted Police tells him because they're cops. And then he offers the guy money for it. Well, it so, solves worth. everybody's problem. Yeah, that's what it's worth. It solves everybody's problem. Then he problems. brings it down here, you know. Well, the, the, the guy that from, from Regina, I can't think of his name, they have handguns from the era when you could have them, but you had to have them at home, and you had to take it to the stunt, to a gun club, and all of that. And they used to come down to the States and hunt handguns and stuff like that. He said, now to try to 
get rid of that gun now. It's something I'm allowed to keep it. But no, oh, those are those guys from Yeah, yeah. He's he going to pass it out to his kids? Yeah, I don't hey. know. I, I, I'm not sure. So he's, he's in a kind of a weird situation. He's got some fine weapons, but he can't sell them, really. I think the only way he could sell them is if he found an export dealer. Yeah. That, and he sold them, you know, it's licensed to export. I think there's a way to do it. There's authorized, there's a couple There's a couple ways to do it, and none of them are easy. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and a lot of paperwork and a lot of fees, and it takes time. Yeah. So they said it wasn't worth the aggravation. At some point, somebody's going to have to do something. They're going to get to that scenario one way or another. Yeah, you'd be like the guy. He liked the guy that called him. He, he said he had a buddy who was a World War II veteran. And when he came back from World War II, he brought back two Japanese bamboo machine guns. Yeah. With the pet stole, I mean, the, the big ones. I don't know how he got them. And here in North Dakota, and he said that uh, he had them. Well, then these laws come out, and they were illegal, and he found out he could get put away for about 20 years for having them, right? He couldn't mm -hmm. even turn them in. So when he did the addition in his basement, he ripped them in the wall. They're still there. Well, then they did that amnesty. Remember later on, a few years, just a few years ago. So him and his son knocked the wall down, and they turned him in. He said he came in there with two bamboo machine guns and four boxes of ammo for him, like about two thousand rounds. And they were like, <laughs> "Is that thing about huh? Well, not as bad as if you had a German MG43 or something. MG42. Forty-two. Right. My buddy got almost got in trouble over that amnesty. He's, he's, he was a GI. He was a EOD in Vietnam, and then he got out and he he, had, he was working in the mines as a dynamiter underground. <laughs> well, his wife thought that was too dangerous. He needed a topside job, so he got a job making nitroglycerin for her to use gunpowder. I don't know that that's any better. That's what he's doing. He's still doing it. No. Well, he's probably getting ready to retire now. Yeah. But and so. His father was in the Battle of the Bulge, you know, and so 